um, when I found out about the uh, organization started by him, I had to become a part of it as much as I can. Thank you very much. It's my honor tonight, um, which, let me put my glasses on. Okay. Um, he's going to uh, um, narrate the presentation tonight. We know that our democracy is at the crossroads. One of the many reasons for our democracy being at the crossroads, as most of you might know, is most people in our country are what you might call low information. <laughs> not knowing, and we know what our media is like, and we need to become knowledgeable. Knowledge is power. So this is why this presentation is so important to me, and I told the group, we've got to show this, because they brought it to our branch meeting. I said, our leaders across the state need to see this, and the people you see in this room, as Carol said, are leaders across all of New Mexico. And to me, have a road show, and if you like what you see, if you want it in your community, we can talk about it after this presentation. Okay? So it is our goal with the Santa Fe branch of the NAACP to fill this gap by this informative, nonpartisan, we must emphasize that, nonpartisan educational presentation. This presentation was shown and well received at one of our branch meetings. Uh, Craig Barnes is an author, a playwright, mediator, essayist, and a champion of civil society. As an attorney, he has litigated civil rights cases. Back in January 2012, Craig Barnes began a series of lectures on his book, Democracy at the Crossroads, and I must show you this book. It will be on sale in the back, the, uh, and I'm sure Craig will sign. Plus other books that are on, the, on the back that he has written that are relevant to this critical time period in our nation. At the end of the lecture uh, series to packed houses, there was mental stimulation and inspiration that gave rise to a thriving grassroots nonpartisan movement. The name of that movement is We Are People Here. We are people here. We are people here. So now, one and a half years later, this group has grown in numbers in our thinking, our outreach, and our vision of what is possible. The group's latest presentation is a banking initiative that this group believes can transform New Mexico's economy and be a model for the rest of the nation. And I really cannot wait to see that. I'm looking forward to that. After Craig's presentation, we will have a very brief discussion and or a question and answer. I'd like to present to you and introduce to others Craig Vaughn. segregation of Denver schools. I was co-counsel with another distinguished lawyer. And, uh, we we uh, spent that summer singing We Shall Overcome under the cottonwoods outside trying to raise money. I have to tell you that, that during the course of that lawsuit, uh, 27 school buses in Denver were blown up, and my plaintiff's house was blown up. So that we, and, and outside my house, we had this constant circle of, of cars driving around slowly in the night, 
and I kept getting these calls about what would happen to my little blonde hair and all. I have to tell you that going through that with the people I went through it with, the leaders of the black community in Denver at that time, made us as close as people can get. I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful to be back just to see some of my old colleagues in different shirts. We've, we've been, um, in the last some years, we've been trying to figure out what's at the core of the problems, all of the different kinds of problems that we, that we face uh, as a community here in, in uh, Santa Fe, here in New Mexico, here in the United States, here in the West, here in the world. And we, we're going to show you tonight some slides that suggest uh, the nature of the problems with which we, we're all dealing, no matter what issues we're talking about and uh, then suggest ways that we might uh, get after it. Let's see if I can get this thing started. started with the music. There it is. Mm -hmm. There's the picture, but there's not the music. So we, we, I, I, you know what, I took the music out of one version of this, and I, I must have taken it out of this as well. So we'll, we'll just keep going. Can you hear me if I stand up here without the microphone? Yes. Yeah, it's a little easier. Yeah. It's a little easier. And I can move around a little bit. So let me know if you can't hear me. Just raise your hand. So we've been asking ourselves, what's at stake in the 2012 elections? I, I would say the same is at stake as going to be at stake in 2014 and in 2016 <laughs> and for the rest of our lives. We're dealing with a condition which is not new and which is not finished, going to be finished in, in uh, November, on November 6th. At stake is the choice between a democratic republic or a plutocracy. Plutocracy comes from this problem, massive inequality. In this country, 20% own 85% of the wealth. So look at the picture as a kind of symbol of the difference in wealth. 20%, 80% of the rest of us own only 15% of the wealth. So we had 100 seats in this, in this uh, room we would have 80 of those seats, 85 of those seats, belonging to just uh, 20, 20 people. 85 of those seats belong to 20 people. All the rest of us, all 80 rest of us would be squeezed into 15 seats. That's the distribution of wealth in America today. It is enormously disproportionate, and it looks like something like this. And that is a condition which affects not just uh, the lower class, but the middle class. It, it, it affects everybody but the very, very, very wealthy. And we are experiencing today in our elections um, much of that problem. Some Americans now have more and more, and most have less and less, with drastic effects on our policies and our culture. Drastic effects. And we ask ourselves, what does this wealth gap look like? Here's what it looks like. Six Walton family members. People who run the Walmart or own the Walmart is just down the road here. Six Walton family members have a net worth equal to the bottom 30% of all Americans. Six. Six people have a net worth equal to the bottom 30% of all Americans. Six. How do, you, how do you get your mind around whether that's fair? Is there something in capitalism underneath capitalism, something underneath the history of the world that says it's fair for six people? They have as much wealth as 30 million or 100 million Americans? How do we get to that? What kind of a system are we in where we can say six people deserve that? No matter what kind of system they have, what, people, what deserving, what has that to do with deserving? Work? Do they work that hard? They have to work really hard to have as much as 100 million other people. That's the situation. And the 400 richest Americans own more wealth than the bottom 150 million. Combined, the 
400 riches. So we're not talking about that it's, we're not saying it's bad to be rich. We're not saying we, we all kind of like to be rich. That's not a bad deal. We like to help me. Help, help me, God. Let me get me up. Get me up the ladder. I do that. Help me. Thanks very much. Be okay. But when there's this, this much disproportion, we pay a price. We pay a huge price. At the very top, 10 acres, looks a lot like this. This is a, a manor in Los Angeles. It was built in 1991. We're not talking about a castle from the Middle Ages. We're talking about 1991 income. We're talking about post-Ronald Reagan income. We're talking about the wealth that comes from the co coagulation of American riches in the hands of a few. This is a, a, a manor house. It's all about 10 acres. A bowling alley. Humidity controlled silver warehouse. That's my favorite. It's got a humidity controlled silver warehouse. Tennis courts, swimming pools, beauty salon, cinemas, and a spa. 18th century roof gardens. It's got the works. That's what 10 acres looks like at the top. Or it may look like this. This is Fairfield Pond, the Hamptons. This is 63 acres. But you can see there's enough room for a family. You can get in there. You got a place for the kids. You got a place where you can eat dinner. You got a place to get around. You, you know, you, you, can, you don't have to get. When I grew up, I bet many of you grew up the same way. The three of us kids in the same room. We all grew up in a room that was about the size of that corner over there. It was fine. We got to know each other. But these guys wouldn't even be able to find each other. Hey, Dad, where are you? Which side of which acreage are you in? Are you lost in the swimming pool or the tennis court? Where are you? Twenty-nine bedrooms, thirty-nine bathrooms. Is that enough to go to the bathroom? I think 39 can do it. I mean, we know what, what did you eat that you need 39 bathrooms? <laughs> they don't, they're not asking themselves that question. And I ask them the question, how did I, how do, do I deserve this? What's happened to us that the story in America doesn't have something to do with deserving? What's happening to us in America that the story doesn't have to do something with I earned it because of I... I, I gave back to the community. Where, who, what kind of personality can live in a place like this with 39 bathrooms and 29 bedrooms and not feel just a little bit shy? Not just a little humble. How did I get to this? Well, I earned it. My daddy earned it. Or my granddaddy earned it. And because my granddaddy earned it, capitalism says my granddaddy earns it, it's okay for me. There's something about that that doesn't compute. It doesn't compute in the human soul. It can only compute if corporations are people. It makes sense. If corporations can build wealth like that, it can compute. It doesn't compute in terms of the human being, in the human soul, in terms of our children, in terms of our kids. Ten acres for most of America looks like this. This is a this is a this is a complex in Brooklyn. There are 1,247 apartments in this complex. Each of you imagine each one has three to five people in it at least. Multiply three to five by 1,200, and you can do that, you're better than me, but you can see how many people are living in that area of 10 acres. So that's what most of America lives like in 10 acres. That's what most of us look like in 10 acres. And the others are living like this. And these are the people who are contributing millions of dollars to the elections that have come up. This is where it's coming from. These, these are the people who have pledged to contribute one billion dollars to elect their candidates in this coming election. One billion. None of us probably, unless you're a secret spy in this room, has a billion to spend. But a billion is what's going in from people like this. So we're not talking about average, ordinary, wealthy people. We're not talking about the easy, you know, millionaire. We're talking about the billionaires. So. Most of us, or many of us, live like that. The reality is that the incomes of the top 1,001% rose 400% between 79 and 2005. Something happened in between 79 and 80 when Ronald Reagan was elected president in 2005, which allowed the top 0.1% to take off in income. And the rest of us during that period have remained flat. That's not an accident. That's not capitalism. That's engineered political and legislative policy. That's not an accident. That happened with a change in the revolution in American philosophy that began in 1980. We have, for the last 30 years, been engaged in a program which would gradually consolidate more and more, again and again, wealth at the top. 
tax policies, the debt policies, the trade policies, have all allowed for this coagulation of wealth at the very, very top to continue and to get to the place where it is today. So we're looking now for a remedy, for the people's remedy. We're looking for a remedy that would say, well, how do you respond to this? Let me first go back and talk a moment about the effects of income, uh, th that enormous wealth gap. The studies show that where you, if you know the degree of the wealth gap in this country or any country in the world, if you know the, the, the difference between the top billionaires and the remainder of the society, the middle class and everybody else, the, the, to the extent of that wealth gap will be predictable, will predict all of the social issues about which you and I are concerned. The greater the wealth gap, the greater the teenage pregnancy. The greater the wealth gap, the greater the use of drugs. The greater the wealth gap, the greater the prison incarceration. The greater the wealth gap, and here's the surprise to middle America, the less innovation. The wealth gap affects innovation. It affects scientific creativity. It, it affects mobility. When I grew up, and grew up in a small rural area in, in uh, eastern Colorado under the Cottonwoods, I grew up and we thought an American could go anywhere, be anybody, do anything. More, a lot more true of white folks than it was of black folks, but it was, true, it was supposed to be true for all of us. That was going to be the coming America. Well, that's no longer the case. It is no longer the case that anybody in America has the mobility that they have in country after country after country with less of a wealth gap. The wealth gap is the predictor. If you know the wealth gap, you know the extent to which you're falling behind in education. You know the extent to which, you know, I can tell you about Singapore, I can tell you where Singapore is in relation to us in education, I can tell you where Denmark is in relation to us in education, I can tell you where they are in, te in teenage pregnancy, I can tell you where they are in mobility, simply by checking the chart that shows where they are on the wealth gap. That research is not just, make, we're not making it up for political campaigns, that's the research uh, that spans everywhere from about the 1940s to the 1980s. That 19, it's about, it's about 2010. A famous book, or really important book, came out in, in uh, 2009, summarizing the research from around the world about the effect of the wealth gap. And they began to say, you know, poor education is not just associated with poverty, it's not just associated with the wealth gap, it is the wealth gap that causes it. And the title of the book is called The Spirit Level. Why? Because the biggest impact is on our spirit. You grow up in the wrong part of town and you look up at the, east, the, the, the hills of East Santa Fe and you think, how am I going to get from the west side of town to the east side of town? What are the stepping stones to get me from my side of town to that side of town? And from Capitol High School, to one of those big houses in the east, what's the stepping stone? How are you going to get there? There isn't a clear way. There isn't a clear way. No wonder people are dropping out. Because the spirit level has been hit. The spirit has been hit. Spirit has been attacked. And this wonderful song we open tonight with is the, cut, is the way back from that. It's the fight against that. But the spirit has been, it's been going down, down in America, across the board, white and black, white and brown and, and, and red. It's been going down everywhere because of this increasing wealth gap. So that's what we're up against. How do we respond? What's the remedy? We've been thinking that it isn't easy enough just to go to the streets. We had 1,200 people in the streets of the legislature this last uh, January 15th when the legislature opened to work on, uh, work on uh, a, a fair taxation bill for big corporations. 1,200 people and the New Mexican didn't cover it. Wasn't in the paper. How many people do we have to have? We got 1,200 people again this coming year and that wouldn't do it. So what do we have to do? We have to get much more organized, much in much more depth, and go after a broader base campaign and with your help, and with the help of other organizations around the state. We begin to reach out and create alliances between us so that we can reach not just hundreds, but thousands. And that's the beginning. But it doesn't begin with just crying and screaming and moaning, it begins with education. Well, we've asked ourselves, around what? What do we educate around? And one of the responses to that could be, if we're talking about, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about democracy ha as having been the possibility there's the possibility for uh, one of our cultures after the next to get into the mainstream, democracy. And plutocracy is the opposite. Plutocracy is government by the people who live in houses like the ones we've just seen. Plutocracy is government by the very, very, very rich. And plutocracy is the most common form of government throughout 
history, not just here, but history. So we're talking about how do we respond. And if we respond, how do we go after plutocracy? We go to Wall Street, and we had a big event in Wall Street a year ago. We had we occupied a square, occupied Wall Street, occupied a square, got a lot of a lot of attention. But holding on to Sukkotti, Sukkotti Square in New York City didn't change the plutocracy. They didn't have to pay any attention to that. So what do we have to do? What what might be the Achilles heel of this giant institution? Giant institution. It might be global banking. So Rwanda said, "We are looking for, we are looking for a place to put the lever. How do you, do you have Archimedes says if you know where to put the lever, you can change the world. Okay, where do you put the lever? You can't go after plutocracy in the abstract. So what do you go after? Maybe global banking is at the center of what we're talking about. Because global banking is the enabler. All of the plutoc plutocracy systems." are tied together and financed by global bank. <clears throat> Banks are vulnerable because of their size and because of their weakness. Their size. Let's take a look at this one illustration of their size. In 2007, the financial industry assets were 58% of the United States GDP. Now imagine that. We said, if we said schools, or we said health, or we said Coal, or was it oil and gas? 58%. The 58% is controlled by the financial industry, which does what? It now trades, ever since 1988 and the Glass Steagall Act repeal, it now trades in uh, investments and it trades in things like, called, like the collateralized debt obligations or credit default swaps. <clears throat> credit default swaps are bets against each other about what. Mortgagee, what's mortgagee is not who's not going to pay his or her mortgage. Those are bets about paying off the mortgage. And they're betting. It's a casino. So if we were talking about the steel industry, or the mining industry, or the trucking industry, where people actually produce wealth for their work, that'd be one thing. But 58% of our total gross domestic product is in trading, trading and speculating on the New York market. There's no, there's no hammer to pick up after that speculation. There's no kid to take to school after that speculation. That's bankers trading with bankers. That's their size. And that's why, because of their size, because they had enabled uh, industry all across the country, that's why Tim Geithner and Hank Paulson in 2007, 2008 said we, they're too big to fail. We can't let them fail because if they fail, all of industry fails. This is an octopus that controls the heart of American culture and American finance and American economy. It's <coughs> so, okay. It's big. It's bigger than we are. How do we respond? We can see, we can argue that they are the central pillar of the plutocracy. They are the central thing that holds up this machine. So if you imagine the major, major players in uh, American uh, politics and, and law, you can see um, that if we're talking about influencing Elections and lobbying in the courts. You could influence all of that, and the big money this is right in your way. I'm clearly not using it, so I might as well get it out. I'm breaking it. How do we get back here? Imagine the, the collection of major enterprises in the in the United States that are that are, have got the, the grip on Congress and they got the grip on the courts and they've got the grip on the presidency. You could list maybe a few more than this: pharmaceuticals, the oil and gas industry, banking, insurance, and defense. You might you might add one or two. The net effect is that these are the people, this is the place where this billion dollars, these are the places from which this billion dollars is going into this, this year's election. They're going into the elections, they go, they go into lobbying, and they go into the, even go into the courts. So campaigns for, for judges in West Virginia and around the country uh, have been gone and, and supported judges that will support greater mining, greater uh, despoilation of the, of, the, of the environment. All of that is, is not, none of that is immune 
from these uh, major contribution efforts. And banking is at the center of it. Banking is what holds them together. Banking is what keeps them afloat. So we say to ourselves, where are we going to put the lever to try to get after this, this thing that has demoralized us, has pushed us to the bottom of the economic ladder, and how do we uh, get after it? This is another way of looking at the same thing. If we look at banking, here it's, it is the finance system for oil and gas, for pharmaceuticals, insurance, and feds. And these are the things that they influence. That's the nature of, the, of American politics today. And that's, that's what we're up against. And furthermore, whatever your cause is, whatever you're working on, whether you're working on civil rights or whether you're working on water, whether you're working on women's rights or whether you're working on health care, whatever your cause, the basis that the, the problem that has been created for you and for me is a problem down here at the bottom if these dollar signs indicate the banking system. The banking system and the plutocracy that it supports is financing a whole array of fruits on the tree that make this plutocracy work. So uh, the bank, the, the, it was the Chamber of Commerce that uh, put their man on the Supreme Court who wrote the opinion that said money is speech. That comes from the Chamber of Commerce. Money is speech means I had a woman in the audience just two weeks ago sitting in the front row saying, I ain't got no money, I ain't got no speech. And that's true, because in this country, now, money equals speech. So that's why we've got billions of dollars allowed by the Supreme Court to go into the electoral process, and people can't can fight against that. How are we going to fight against that? So this whole array of things, we may be working on public unions, we may be working at just trying to stop fracking, or to fight for the EPA, or to fight for civil rights, or to fight for women. All those issues that we've spent our lives on are adversely affected by the sap in this plutocracy tree that is money. It goes up and feeds the system. The system is fed by that substantial, those substantial amounts of money. And here's another key point. That tree, call it the tree, the money tree, or the plutocracy tree. That tree is at this plutocracy, which, which is the core of it. And if we say, well, okay, we're going to stop clipping at the top all the time, we're going to cut at the core. If we cut at the core, we're actually not even at the basis of it yet. The basis of it is the soil from which the tree grows. And the tree grows from the story that money is God-given, and that those who uh, have the most are most likely to go to heaven. That's a current story from the 16th century. Those who've got the most are clearly designated by God to go to heaven. And that's a story which underlies this self-righteousness that gives us the right to have 29 bedrooms and 39 bathrooms. Oh, I might have more bathrooms in your bedroom. <laughs> some, some, maybe you have them at the tennis courts. So the, the, uh, the, the effect is that when we if, we, if we, if we don't in some way, I love, I love the song that we begin with, that you began with. That's a story. That's a story of a people coming into their own. That's a story of, that people have dignity. That's a story of justice. That's a story of the possibility. That's a story of where we could go to if we stay with it and don't get discouraged. It's a story of that we are human beings here. And when we began to, when I began to write this book, Democracy at Crossroads, and began to work with, uh, with history, I began to notice that down through time, I, it was 1381 in England, there was a peasant rebellion. Peasant rebellion. Peasants rose up because a tax collector came to Watt Tyler's daughter and began to attack her sexually. And old Watt Tyler hit that tax collector on the head with a hammer and bashed him in. And then he led a rebellion on the way to London saying, kill all the lawyers, kill all the lawyers. <coughs> and burned up the courthouses and they started killing lawyers. They did kill lawyers. He killed the Chief Justice of, the, of England in that, in 1380. And what Watt Tyler was saying is, wait a minute, tax collector, we're people here. He said, we're people. We're peasants, but we're people. When you began to see women in the American Revolution, and then, then Susan Cady Stanton and, and, and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and who's the other? Yeah. Yeah. Susan B. Anthony. We began to see them speaking in the 19th century. What they, what they were saying to the court was, we had a performance here this week where Susan B. Anthony was saying to the court, you consider me a jail judge, but I'm a person. I'm a person here, and I will never pay your fine because I'm a person here. In 1896, there was a Rebellion in the Philippines, 
led by uh, a, a doctor by the name of Jose Rizal. Jose Rizal said to the Spanish in this midst of this rebellion, wait a minute. He said, and this is, well, wait a minute. We are people here. We may be people of color in the Philippines, but we are people here. And I, that, I read that first 40 years ago. And it stuck in my mind. Somewhere in the back of my mind was, that's the cry. That's the cry time out of mind. We are people. That's what a corporation being a person violates. That's why it is such an offense to human nature to say that a corporation, which is only paper in a filing cabinet, has the equivalent rights of a person that suffers and dies and cares for our children. We're trying to feed them. We get sick and we hurt. We're anguished. That's not a corporation. It doesn't have any of that. There's no moral value. There's no basic bottom line of moral value how we treat jailers people. None of that. And that's what we've been saying down through the centuries. Wait a minute. Because corporations are not new in the 1980s. Corporations are not new in the 1970s. Corporations are not new in the 1930s. Corporations were around to trouble Thomas Jefferson uh, in, in 1776, 1789. Corporations have been a problem a long time. And underneath that is this continuous cry, this continuous statement that we are people here. And so what we, what we think we need to be doing, um, as much as anything in the world, is not only understanding that they're trying to cut off our pensions, they're trying to cut off our opportunity to vote. Right now, voter suppression is going on all over the country to keep black people and <coughs> brown people and poor people and elderly people and students from voting. That's going on all over the country in an orchestrated way, creating schools in Albuquerque to tell people in New Mexico you can't vote without a driver's license. It's wrong. It's dead wrong. It's a lie. But they're training people how to say that and go to the polls and tell people. And they're doing that with money that they didn't make themselves. They're doing that with money that came from the people that own the 29-bedroom houses. That's where it's coming from. And they're doing that to, in order to suppress our votes. And, the, and the, the, the only way we get back to that, the beginning way we get back to that, is to understand that, wait a minute, we have a, a dignity which cannot be erased. We have a consciousness which cannot be erased. We have a claim to the future and the justice and the fairness which cannot be erased. And we will not sit back and let it be erased. Just because some court, led by a justice on this, from, who comes from the Chamber of Commerce, thinks that the corporations should be people and that, that money should be speech. We won't stand for that. We won't stand for that. And the story we will tell is a story of the people, the story of Martin Luther King's history and, and Jose Rizal's history and Watt Tyler's history. We are all a part of that. We're all a part of that. Native American history. We're all a part of that. And it is time for us now to gather together and understand who's got what piece of that and how we put it together in a puzzle and sing that song together. Sing that song in harmony. The various ones of us with the various life experiences come together and sing that song in a harmony. So we are people here. Above all, we are people here. Nobody is going to get away with teaching us as as uh, as uh, as uh, commodities, or consumers, or algorithms of profit. We are not algorithms of profit. We are not mathematical formula in order to decide how much we're going to pay. We are people. We are people. And that's the story that NAACP is telling and has been telling all its time. That's the story that Mark, Mark, uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall told in the case that I eventually did get to the Supreme Court, and we did eventually win in 1973. We did win, thanks to Thurgood Marshall and a few others. So it can be done, and we will not give up that possibility. So, if we get back to these tactics, in addition to the story, we have to have a way to put that story into practice. One way is to have an effect on banking. If we have an effect on banking, we will have an effect on the whole plutocracy, the whole network. If we have an effect on the plutocracy, then we can have an effect on every issue that's up on that tree that we've all been fighting for. So if we get a plutocracy, we can get it at all. And let's notice this. Global banking is not community banking. Global banking is not the same as our local banks. It is not the same as Los Alamos National Bank. It's not the same as Century Bank. It's not the same. Global banking is different. It is not, global banking is hugely consolidated. It sees local business, students, ranchers, homeowners, Algor as algorithms of profit. What do I mean by that? Mathematical calculations about how much we can pay and when, how many of us are going, to, are going to default. It's a stock calculation based on numbers and not based on who we are. When I used to represent farmers in the, in the western, eastern Colorado, 
they'd go out and they would have they'd be go, going after their annual loan to get seed to put the seed in the ground to raise a crop. And the farmer would look at the rent, the banker, who was a local banker, would look at the farmer and say, How'd you do last year, Joe? And Joe would say, Well, I did pretty good, but we had a flood in, in May. Okay, well, what are your chances? Chances are good. And the banker and Joe looked at each other in the eye, and the banker made a loan based on how they knew Joe was as a farmer. I had a, I had a farmer client like that, and across the road was a pig farmer who was a sloppy pig farmer, and his pigs kept getting out. The pigs were trying to cause him trouble, and he couldn't get a loan. He couldn't get a loan. <laughs> Because the banker knew what kind of a sloppy farmer he was. And that's banking. That's banking that's useful. Banking that says, okay, you do your job, you do your work, you get your loan. If you don't do your job, you, we're not going to give you a loan. But in this last 30 years, none of that was true. The people on Wall Street that were doing credit default swaps had no idea who was at the bottom of that chain. Had no idea who was paying or not paying that mortgage. And it, as a result, now the whole loaning uh, system is contracted. And people aren't able in Santa Fe and at Brown Mexico to get loans to start new businesses. People aren't able to get loans to go to school. People aren't able to get loans to the front ranches and the farms. And that's because uh, this is global banking now that controls New Mexico as well as everybody else it, and not local banking. And here's another point about banking. You know, we're talking about this very large thing that's happened to America, the takeover of America by the very, very, very wealthy, the billionaires. On the one hand, we're talking about that large C. And on the other, we're talking about now, we're talking about, okay, how do we get at it? Well, maybe we could get at it if we got at the, the issue of banking. This is a chart which shows the consolidation of banking. When I say that banking is not your neighborhood bank anymore, you can't read this, but I'll tell you what it says. And you might be able to see that there are a whole set of uh, lines that narrow and narrow and narrow until we get to one, two, three, four. This over here, trust me, is a list of banks that existed just a few years ago. These are banks, this is out of focus, and maybe I can focus it a little bit. First Commerce, Bank of America, First Chicago, Somebody Bank Corporation. Great Western Financial, all the way down, it's a whole list of banks. Those banks are now consolidated into these four other banks, that whole list. That's what's happened to American banking. So when the farmer in, the, in Socorro, the farmer outside of, of uh, uh, Cusis wants to get a loan, he's very likely to be dealing with somebody at this end who thinks of him as a mathematical calculation about whether or not he can... Uh, he, he, he's going to succeed and not as a human being. That's the system and that's, that's the consolidation which is taken away from us community banking. And then I said that there, the weakness in banking is moral, <coughs> legal, and political. Let's say moral weakness. They are paid unconscionable bonuses. They have a lack of community responsibility. They are gaming the rates and they are gambling rather than banking. But that's, that's a list of moral irresponsibility. Number one, bonuses. <coughs> Bankers in 2010 got bonuses equal to $90 billion. Five major firms got bonuses equal to $5 billion, which is more money than the gross domestic product of 23 countries. How do you justify that morally? How do you figure out by trading, uh, trading financial instruments in Wall Street, you somehow ought to have $90 billion in, in, in returns when people are losing their houses, losing their jobs, and the economy's going to hell in a handbasket, and you say to yourself, well, $90 billion is okay because I've been a part of the capital system, and the capitalist banking system is okay, and we do that. That's the way the system works, and sorry, some people lose. That's immoral. That's immoral. And there is a lack of community responsibility. The federal government poured into a bank in Louisiana, this is a quote from a bank, a bank president of Louisiana, the federal government poured in after Katrina, $300 million of bailout money. And this banker said, make more loans. We're not going to change our business model or our credit policies to accommodate the needs of the public, as they see it, to have us make more loans. We're not going to be publicly responsible. We're going to take your money, $300 million, and we're going to keep it. We're not going to loan it. How do you justify that if you're supposed to be a community institution? And here's another way. They're gaming the system. They're getting money in the bailout at 2%, and they're loaning back to us at 3%. 
They're making money on guaranteed loans at 3%, and it's our money. They're making money off of loaning money to us and making money off. And they're gambling rather than banking. This guy was testifying for the Democratic caucus, and he said, this is a big casino. American banking today is a big casino. So we have people getting fired because they're blowing the whistle on the casino. We have Wall Street in, 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 in trouble, and the headlines are talking about it a lot. Stocks crashed because of Wall Street in trouble. Time says we're, working, we're facing in the new hard times, because morality lost has its social consequences. And then there are legal weaknesses in the banking system. The SEC accuses Goldman Sachs of fraud. These are headlines from the New York Times. SEC accuses Goldman of fraud in the housing deals. New fraud inquiries. J.P. Morgan's loans lost money. LIBOR rate, rate fixing scandal. Let me tell you, as a trial lawyer, when we're talking about fraud, there is a meaning to the word fraud. What fraud means is not you're a bad person. I don't like you because your hair is brown or your hair is white or whatever it is. When you say fraud in the law and in these headlines, you mean that this company intentionally misrepresented its product in order to get somebody else to rely on your misrepresentation, and they, and they did rely on your representation, and they lost money. That's fraud. That's criminal fraud. An intentional representation inducing reliance, which results in damage, is fraud. How does that happen? That happens when Goldman Sachs sells financial instruments to some people and tells them, you're going to make a million out of this, you're going to do great, and then sells other financial instruments to other people based on the prospect of probability that the ones you just sold are going to fail. Mm -hmm. you're, you're cheating the people you, you, you sold the first set to in order to make money on the second set. That's fraud. And that's what it talks about. SEC accuses Goldman of fraud in housing goods. That's what's happening. Fraud is legal problem. We're not just saying you're bad guys. We're saying you're legally vulnerable. And what would happen if the people of New Mexico began to gather around and say to themselves, okay, we've had enough of this. We're going to take out after the big banks, the huge banks, and we're going to do something about it. What would happen if we all gathered together all over the state and said we're going to do something to raise these issues, to make them conscious, and to make a campaign that had its, uh, its intention on, uh, on these legal problems? These are two headlines that talk about more uh, uh, legal <coughs> problems. They are not only morally and legally vulnerable, they are politically vulnerable. Already we had Dodd-Frank legislation passed in the first two years of the Obama administration. Occupy Wall Street said to the world, wait a minute, we've got a big problem here. And now we're considering, in, in some, this, this is not wrong, in some, yeah, 13 states, we're considering a state bank which would get back at this problem, which would give us a huge way to invest our money in the state, not in Wells Fargo, not in Bank of America, but in a state bank where the state itself uh, control its income. So what do we do? We educate, we engage, and we legislate. Global banking is the perfect focus for people's movement. There's local branches, we all know. It's shifting to community, it's shifting to the community banks is an action we can all take. And the massive shift has the potential to become a national movement. If we could do this all together, we have the potential to become a movement that spreads to Colorado, that spreads to Arizona, that spreads to Utah, and spreads across the country. So we have the potential, because we've got a big problem in Wall Street, we can't do anything about Wall Street, but they're represented right down here in the corner in each town we live in. Each town we live in has has got a bank that is part of this problem. So we could, if we shifted money out of those banks, if we could, if did something about our credit cards in those banks, if we did something about our loans from those banks and move them to community banks, we have a chance. So the first part is to, to uh, educate. We've got to learn what we're up against. We're not just up against bad people, we're up against the system. And we have to reward community banking. We have to engage and consider changing banks, consider changing credit cards, consider joining a movement mm -hmm. and getting together to do something. Legislation, we're talking about state banks, we're talking about the state of New Mexico putting its money in directly into uh, state banks and community banks rather than into big banks where they pay interest to big banks. Why not? If they put it in a state bank, they're not paying any interest at all. North Dakota's got one of these and it's working just great. Just working great. And here's what we should never forget the government by the people, for the people, and of the people is the trend of history. It is the direction of history. It is the way in which the last 700 years have progressed. Martin Luther King was right. It is the bend of history. History does bend toward justice. It does
doesn't bend in a single generation. It doesn't bend for a single leader. It doesn't bend in a time of crisis in one crisis. But over a 700 year history, the people who can now vote, who never could vote before, the people who can now uh, invest, who could never invest before, the people who can now get jobs and go to school, who could never get jobs and go to school before, that those numbers are growing. Now in the last 30 years, those numbers have been contracted. And we can say to ourselves, oh my God, we're in tough shape. And that is true. But if you look at the long span of Western history, and you look at the long span of global history, democracy is on the march. Democracy is spreading. And democracy just means government by the people, of the people, and for the people. We have our chance. We should never lose, lose sight of the fact that we, we in, in, in the beginning, the time of the American Revolution, and gradually preceding uh, generation after generation since the American Revolution, more and more people have participated in the kind of government that allows us to get ourselves educated, to get jobs, to get a chance for the future. And we've had setbacks before. We have coagulation of money before. But we are not going to let this one get us, take it away from us forever. Sometimes some threats in Rome, in Florence, in English history, some threats have taken it away for generations. We're not going to let that happen. We're going to organize now. We're going to organize in, on, around issues like the banking issue. Not because the banking issue saves our soul so much, but because that's where there's a critical vulnerability and a critical weakness. And if we do it together, if we pick our subject together, and if we find ways to bring alliances from, from the unions, and alliances from schools, and alliances from the pensioners, and alliances with the old people, and alliances with young people, if we could find, if we possibly had the leadership, we had the followership, if we had the general, if we had the collective ability to work together, if we could do all of that together, then we could begin to raise the hopes again that we had in the 1960s. We begin to raise the possibility for advance that we had in the 1960s. And we could begin to liberate people again. It is toward that liberation again that we should all be working still. And never, never get discouraged just because we win or lose this election or any election. We've been at this as a people, not just night since the 1960s, not just since the Civil War. We've been at this as a people for at least 700 years. And we are not going to give up now. So God bless you. God bless you all for hanging in there, for being here tonight, for sticking together, and for joining with others to stick together and make this future one that we can claim for ourselves. Thank you very much. Craig, thank you so much. This is real education and the word plutocracy. And how cool is this? Guess who walked in the back door? Our state treasurer. <laughs> so it's good. Talking about the banking. He's going to be our speaker at the luncheon tomorrow. To those of you who would like to come to the luncheon, James Lewis will be our keynote speaker.